Thank you very much. So you will already have heard about some of the data for weight change on different ARVs. I shall be covering the mechanisms and then we'll be hearing about the consequences. Now, this is my opinion, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. I think one of the problems is when a new issue emerges, we sometimes rush too fast to gather our data without taking a breath and planning what we are going to analyze. And because of that, I think trying to understand the data we have related to weight change and antiretrovirals is my favorite expression, like herding cats. So my first lesson to you all is that Disparate and underpowered studies, however well-intentioned, can generate more questions than answers. And I think achieving consensus about appropriate endpoints and study designs sooner would do all of us, particularly people living with HIV, a better service. Moving on though, we know being overweight and obese are increasingly common. Globally, more than half of the world's population are overweight or obese, and we know in many parts of the world, including the UK, that proportion is much higher. Now, what causes this? Ultimately, it's an imbalance. It's an imbalance between what we're taking in and what is coming out in terms of energy expenditure. It's fairly simple. The question is, are any of the drugs we're using changing that balance? But the second lesson is simply that obesity is common. So as people with HIV lead increasingly normal lives, obesity will also be common for them. And we've seen good large US cohort data showing just that, that people with HIV are catching up with or even overtaking the general population. So let's address the first question, and, and Chloe will have showed you some of this data already, that do integrases cause weight gain? Now, relative to efavirenz, yes, certainly for second generation integrases, relative to other core agents, it's hard to say. This slide, which has been shown in every weight talk I've seen in the last couple of years, a analysis of eight first line trials clearly shows if you look at the forest plot on the right, that it's particularly our second generation integrases, bitegravir and dolutegravir, that are associated with excess weight gain relative to efavirenz. However, a similar analysis of suppressed switch studies wasn't quite so clear cut. So in this analysis, people randomized to stay on their background regimen or switch were compared. And what you see overall, people switching in that blue line gained more weight than people who stayed on their previous regimen. And perhaps not surprising because in general switch was to more modern drugs, but a 1.6 compared to 0.4 kilo weight change at year one, with most of the weight gain being in the first six months, which is important when you're counselling patients. Baseline antiretrovirals were critical though, and it was particularly switching off efavirenz, which we'll come back to, although not so much to second generation integrases, it was particularly switching to real pivirine or elvitegravir that was associated with more weight gain. And the other feature was switching off TDF to TAF, again, something we shall revisit later in the talk. But for me, it's all a bit less certain when you're looking at suppressed switch studies compared to first line and the differences are much less marked. Which leads me to this, is this weight gain or the argument that's emerged more recently, is it loss of weight loss, i.e. are older drugs driving weight loss and newer drugs aren't? And that explains the difference. Now, I think one of the most compelling studies for the loss of weight loss argument is this. It's IMPACT 2010, and it's a randomized treatment trial in pregnant women. And the key thing is here, we have a normal weight gain to aim for, a healthy weight gain in pregnancy, which is shown in that dotted line. And what we see, least weight gain with TDF and efavirenz, followed by TDF and dolutegravir, and on the right in red is TAF FTC dolutegravir. So like advance, although the greatest weight gain was on TAF and dolutegravir therapy, that was closest to normal. So that would suggest that the excess weight gain is actually more normal weight gain. 
So lesson three is the importance of understanding trends in appropriate controls. So what should we be seeing? And then what are we seeing in people with HIV? And here, with a standard weight gain known in HIV negative pregnant women, we can see that actually some of the apparently excess weight gain may be normal after all. Now, coming on to mechanisms. So one of the things that was studied in advance was the impact of CYP2B6 polymorphisms, because this is the key enzyme for efavirenz metabolism. So polymorphisms associated with different levels of efavirenz exposure. Now, rapid metabolizers or extensive metabolizers of efavirenz, so have lower exposure, saw the same weight change as people on dolutegravir. It was only the intermediate or slow metabolizers with their consequent higher efavirenz exposure that the difference in weight change emerged. So a clear dose response between efavirenz and weight change. But why? There may be a dose response, but what could the mechanism be? And in fact, this paper published a decade ago shows that if favorins causes a dose dependent repression of fat cells and also impacts the genes and gene products that are key to fat cell function. So a clear mechanism with a dose response. And then we see that cytochrome polymorphisms associated with differences in efavirenz exposure are also associated with differences in weight change. So I think building up to a fairly compelling argument that efavirenz may be driving changes in weight. What about the integrases? Well, we've seen data showing integrases cause fat cell fibrosis and for dolutegravir fat cell hypertrophy. But is that a mechanism in itself? And until we understand what's causing the changes in fat cells, to me, that's more of an end point rather than an actual mechanism. What I think is important to emphasize here, though, is not all weight change and not all fat gain is necessarily equal. And this study shows that people who gain weight on switching to an integrase, it's less metabolically unhealthy fat than people gaining weight on a non-integrase. So just because people are gaining the same amount of weight, the quality of fat may differ and the ultimate consequences may also differ. There's some data from older studies suggesting that antiretroviral associated weight change is generally more harmful fat than you see in HIV negative populations, but I think still an awful lot to study and understand. Now, one mechanism that has been discussed a lot is the melanocortin-4 receptor, and this is part of the most potent mechanism for controlling food intake and energy balance in mammals. Now, we know melanocortin-4 receptors are crucial. It's one of the important causes of the admittedly rare monogenic obesity caused by reduced function. And we know that mice who have this receptor knocked out are obese mice. So it's a well-known mechanism. And some early data on dolutegravir shows it can inhibit this receptor at physiologic concentrations. However, that wasn't replicated in this study, where they showed that all of the integrases could inhibit this receptor, but only at supra-physiological concentration, so much higher exposure than you'd see with normal dosing. So they concluded this was unlikely the mechanism. I guess I would say that in vitro doesn't always translate precisely to in vivo. And is it possible that some form of compartmentalization is happening? We know integrases bind to the integrase enzyme for a long period of time. So could there be differences in how long they're binding to this melanocortin receptor? Could a kind of partial but prolonged blockade be driving some form of weight change. So I think this is still worthy of further study. Now, coming back to the pharmacogenetics, I showed you the correlation in advance. It's also been looked at in this paper published this year, and they looked at two groups. One was a cohort of 60 people switching from efavirenz to an integrase, and they showed the greatest weight gain in people who were slow efavirenz metabolizers. So they had the higher efavirenz exposure and switching off efavirenz to an integrase associated with the greater weight gain, which makes sense because there's more effect 
to reverse. However, they didn't see an impact of UGT polymorphisms, which are correlated with integrase exposure on the degree of weight gain. So a relationship for efavirenz, but no relationship for integrases with genetic polymorphisms and weight change. For the three first line ACTG studies listed here, again, there was an association between slow efavirenz metabolism and weight change for people on efavirenz, but only for people who were on a TDF containing backbone, not a bacavir. So is there some kind of synergy between efavirenz and TDF? What's driving the fact it was only different for people on TDF and not for a bacavir? And again, I think we just do not know. But pharmacogenomics in general may prove to be a very helpful tool in the future. And I think importantly, if we are trying to understand if integrases are associated with weight change, the fact there's no relationship with genetic polymorphisms and drug exposure would suggest perhaps there isn't a direct association between integrase use and weight change. But we do know that polymorphisms driving differences in integrase exposure are correlated with central nervous system side effects. So this early work looking at dolutegravir timing and impact on insomnia, then this kind of work looking at UGT polymorphisms and a correlation between trough dolutegravir levels and neuropsychiatric adverse events. And finally, this paper looking at different single nucleotide polymorphisms, showing again a correlation between those polymorphisms and integrase exposure, and then a correlation between integrase exposure and CNS side effects, particularly here for raltegravir and abnormal dreams. So there is a correlation with CNS toxicity, but no correlation with weight, which to me suggests maybe second generation INSTEs are not a culprit. So lesson four is a dose response is an important element of assessing any potential causality. Now, one thing that integrases and efavirenz have in common also is they can impact mood. So I've shown you some of the data looking at integrase exposure being correlated with CNS side effects. And of course, efavirenz is very well known to be associated with neuropsychiatric adverse events. So could it be through a change in mood that drugs are having differential impacts on weight? Because of course the brain is crucial. I will not talk you through this diagram, but this summarizes the neural systems controlling appetite, energy balance and weight. And you can see they're incredibly complex. Not just are they complex, but unlike some of the other potential side effects of antiretrovirals, there is a voluntary control. So you can choose to eat more or less. You can choose to exercise or not exercise. So teasing out the impact of drugs when there's this volitional element as well is really complicated. So lesson five is weight regulation is very complex. So the studies we do to investigate the relationship with HIV drugs need to be similarly complex and designed in a way that can answer some of these questions. So that was integrases versus efavirenz. What about TAF? Then certainly relative to TDF, we do see extra weight gain and relative to abacavir also. And of course, abacavir has not been studied as pre-exposure prophylaxis, so it's hard to really understand, but TDF has. And by studying TDF versus placebo or TAF as PrEP, it removes the complexity of additional antiretroviral classes, and it removes the complexity of HIV and its impact on metabolics per se. IPREX showed us that people with detectable tenofovir gained less weight than people on placebo. People without detectable tenofovir, as you may expect, there was really no difference. So a correlation with tenofovir exposure and less weight change on tenofovir or TDF than placebo. Now, the important thing is, although nausea has been hypothesized as a potential driver of less weight gain, although there was more nausea overall in the TDF arm, when they correlated reports of nausea with weight change in a multivariable analysis, there was no impact. The other important thing here is we're looking at percent change in body weight, not kilos, and the average body weight at the start of the study was 66 kilograms. So the maximum difference in this study, and that's at the week 48 time point, is a kilogram. What about Discover? 
So IPREX was TDF versus placebo, discover TDF versus TAF, year one, a kilo difference. Two things. One, you would expect some weight gain on TDF, probably about 0.4 to 0.5 kilos, but you wouldn't necessarily expect as much as a kilo weight gain as you saw on TAF. So a degree of weight suppression, but in my opinion, also a degree of extra weight gain on the TAF arm. Week 96, now people on TDF have gained half a kilo, which is a fairly normal population weight change. So this suggests that TDF's effect is early and then plateaus. For TAF, there's been an additional 0.7 kilos, which could be normal, could be slightly higher depending on the trajectory in your controls. So if there's this maximum kilo difference, why do you see so much weight change in this study? And this study took people on dolutegravir with either TDF or TAF in the backbone, and everyone ended up on dolutegravir or BIC with a TAF backbone. So the key thing is everyone is on a second generation integrase throughout, but some people are staying on TAF, some people are switching TDF to TAF. And those who were staying on TAF gained 0.6 kilos, those switching from TDF to TAF gained 2.2. So even allowing for this kilo difference in IPREX, even allowing for about a 0.6 gain in the general population, there is still, in my opinion, some excess weight gain when you switch from TDF to TAF. So it's not just a TDF effect. And we saw similar in the OPERA cohort in people switching from TDF to TAF. Why? Now, this is where I'm entering the realms of guesswork. So one, I do think there is still some potential impact of TAF on insulin sensitivity. We're awaiting the gold standard clamp study results. But in Tango, removing TAF was associated with a degree of improvement in insulin resistance, not statistically significant in the unboosted group, but still a 30% improvement. Now, since week, 48, since week 48, this difference disappears. So the longer you follow Tango up, then this signal is lost. But the problem is the longer you follow people up, the more other factors that influence weight start playing a role. So for me, this is the cleanest time point. And I think there is potential here for a signal. And because insulin sensitivity is so into with weight regulation, this could be a potential mechanism for TAF-related weight gain. Nausea, we've discussed, gut microbiome. So actually there's some evidence that NRTIs impact the gut microbiome in a negative way more than other drug classes. And we know the gut microbiome is very closely correlated with weight change. So could this be a mechanism by which TDF is causing some weight loss? Could TAF be impacting gut microbiome in a different way? Again, important to study. Could this be primarily related to lipids? And my friend and colleague, Marta Buffito, talks about the fact that TDF may be binding lipids in the gut, which accounts for its relative lipid lowering effect, but that could also impact weight. And finally, bone loss. No one talks about this, but if you're losing bone density on TDF, that weighs something. And my own back of the envelope calculation suggests that could be up to 0.2 or 0.3 kilos. I'm happy to stand corrected. And these are some of the other mechanisms from the field of psychiatry. So there is so much more to study. Antipsychotics well associated with excess weight gain. So an awful lot of other things for us to study for antiretrovirals. So lesson six is we still have much to learn and we still have much to investigate, but we should involve obesity experts from the start to help us make sure that research is the best research we can do. And the harms, we'll be hearing more about consequences, but the harms of excess weight are well established. So regardless of the cause, we must be knowledgeable to counsel the people we see in clinic. And that means knowing what the latest randomized data shows about different types of exercise and different types of diet. And we must think about the context Weight change may drive negative endpoints, but there are other things that drive important endpoints such as cardiovascular disease. And here are platelet function studies showing differences between integrases and protease inhibitors here that we must think about risk factors across the board and understand the net impact rather than just looking at one particular change. And finally, stigma. 
please read this paper about stigma in obesity. We know stigma is rife in the field of HIV and there are some fascinating parallels here. I really encourage you to have a look. So I shall finish there. Thank you for your kind attention. I look forward to some discussion. Thank you.